Christopher Robin Cox, and you're listening to Burnt Out in Budapest. On the episode today, we're going to do something a little different, hopefully something that we'll continue to do in the future. I want to talk about a really controversial film, Planet of the Humans. It was directed by Jeff Gibbs and executive produced i.e. bankrolled by the otherwise great filmmaker Michael Moore on the podcast today to help me discuss this film to think about it in a few different contexts think about what's good and what's bad about the film is Sean Parson he's a PhD from the University of Oregon he's an associate professor in the departments Politics and International Affairs and Sustainable Communities at Northern Arizona University. He's the author of the book Cooking Up a Revolution, Food Not Bombs, Homes Not Jails, and Resistance to Gentrification. That's on Manchester University Press, came out in 2018. He's also the co-editor of Superheroes and Critical Animal Studies, The Heroic Beasts of Total Liberation. That's on Lexington Academic Press, came out in 2017. He's on the editorial board for Abolition, a journal of insurgent politics, and a board member for the Institute for Critical Animal Studies. And he is also a caucus member for New Political Science. He's a, he's a generous guy, um, finding time in his otherwise wildly busy schedule to, uh, to sit down and talk with me about this film. I specifically wanted to talk to Sean because he comes at this from a really interesting perspective where he is very interested in the sort of polemic between nihilism and optimism, if you will, um, or the, the sort of competing elements of the environmental movement where one side is very catastrophist, right? And then there's this other side that's sort of you know, techno-optimistic. There's going to be some kind of a techno-fix, right? But here's the thing. The environmental catastrophe that we are living through right now is not simply human-caused. It is not about humans as a bully species that is just inherently dead set on destructing every space that we encounter. It is about the human species living under the perpetual domination of a system that is based upon making nature work for it, making nature profitable, if you will. And I'm going to leave it there for now, but uh, I keep that in mind as we engage in this conversation, and hopefully when we come out at the other end, we can make sense of all of this. In the meantime, please go subscribe to the podcast, anywhere you see the words, burnt out in Budapest. grew up intellectually in the green anarchist community in the Northwest, which I know you know a decent amount about. And yeah. I was like good friends with John Zerzan when I lived in Eugene. I still oh, wow. you know, talk with him every now and again. Like I did some writing for the Green Anarchy Journal. Like, you know, I would get engaged with those folks all the time. Yeah. And this narrative that comes out here it's so funny, like there's this shock that's coming out of the, especially liberal environmentalist side, mm -hmm. but across the board, that is the same shock that a lot of the traditional anarchists and Marxists took with the green anarchist folks. Cause it's a very similar argument in both the ways that it's really positive and the ways that I think it's really bad. Yeah, you know, like, yeah, like yeah. as I've kind of moved away from that and kind of embraced a lot of more complicated thinking yeah. i see both the positives of that kind of anti-civ argument mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. this one pushes forward but and then all the negatives and all the political baggage that comes with it too and i feel like this film yeah. could have been made in like 2005 and it would have followed john zerzan and the people who were protesting the wto 
Yeah. And, and like that. And it would have been this very similar film um, with a you know, similar argument. <laughs> when I first read, I was going to Portland State University. It's actually when yeah. that was when I met you back, uh, yeah, yeah. back when I was doing environmental political theory and I was getting my master's degree in political theory. Yeah. And and I had this kind of brief moment where I was really diving into, you know, Derek Jensen and John Zerzan mm -hmm. and, and, and a host of other folks, you know, just really trying to like, cause there was these bits of these nuggets of just really useful thinking in the anti-civ kind of framework that whole, like, like maybe this is just industrial civilization that is really at fault here, you know, but the problem yeah. was they, they never, at the end of it, when I would put the book down, I would go, yeah, but so what do we do? Kill ourselves? Exactly. Mass suicide? I mean, what's the answer to this? You know, you know so uh -huh. they, there wasn't enough of any, and I felt like there was this really elitist kind of white narrative, yeah. which was like, you know, moving off the grid and, you know, you know, living in a cabin somewhere in the woods, you know. Like that and, does and, something. Yeah, it's like, you know, I'm sorry, but if you're, if you're living in the inner city, and you happen to be a, you know, a, a black family trying to survive in like Detroit, you know, you know, and, and some white dude says, well, you should just move off the grid, man. You know, you won't have to work and, you know, and all that. So it's like, they're just going to laugh in your face. You know, you know, it's like, that's not a solution for like 80% of the world's population, you know, if you not know, it's more, just, if not like, more, right. Yeah. 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 So I always was left uncomfortable by that, you know. That was and it's also very neoliberal because the only yes. solution is, well, you go live off grid in a cabin, which actually does nothing to either slow mm -hmm. environmental destruction, stop environmental destruction, or do anything. It's literally like yeah. the same thing that right wing survivalists have. Yeah, you know? exactly. Where's the Where's the left and the right and the right? perspective and that's that because too, of yeah. their rejection of the i mean at the core of them is this rejection of the left and the claiming of being post-left mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which at the end of the day ends up frankly making them more mostly conservative yeah <laughs> um, yeah in, yeah uh, in the in very traditional case. sense of the word too yeah exactly yeah um but yeah i feel like this film though i mean it brings in so many of those ideas as uncritically as i think the other folks do and one of the things that always bothered me about that perspective is it flattens everything. Yeah. So for yeah, instance, yeah. that analysis gives you no understanding of how we move from feudalism to capitalism. Right. It gives you no, underst of, uh, no understanding of why we have uneven development in even globally, but let alone in the United States. Right. right? There's no way you can, because if it's civilization, it's abstracted and universalized to 10,000 years and all history yeah. is just the same story of power dynamics. But and 500 years ago, roughly, everything changed dramatically. And, and there's no, no one way wants to talk about it. that, right? <laughs> and there's no way from that perspective to understand why, how right. it changed. And because of that, they can't understand how to actually do any other change. Because change yeah. is almost like in a way, it's very similar to, I don't know, have you read Jacques Alul? No, no. So he has this argument where it's just like, it becomes tech determinism, where yeah, 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 it becomes yeah. a dialectic in which the technology just has a feedback loop. And yeah. so it's literally just technology changes regardless of human action. And with that, society changes around it. But that yeah. provides no space for really engaging with actual politics there's actually a, a point in the movie where they interview uh what's his name uh, sheldon solomon the social he's a social psychiatrist psychologist i guess yeah the, who i've never heard of i never heard of him before either but he, he sounded pretty brilliant but what he says in the movie is if we're gonna make progress we're going to need to radically overhaul our basic conception of who and what we are and what it is we value. And he says something to this effect. If we think there's some kind of future that looks a little bit like now, and is, but is just shinier and more sustainable and, and mm -hmm. cleaner and all that, then we're, we're fucking fooling ourselves. You know, you know I mean, it's, it's, it's just not gonna happen that way. 
And the thing that the film, and this is, I'll, maybe we can start with what's good about the film. Yeah, yeah. I the think thing so. that The thing that the film really just, for me, did really well, and maybe because I was already looking for this message, which is never mm-hmm. given to me, is mm-hmm. that um, we are insane for expecting the change that is necessary, which is actual system change, which is what all the scientists are asking for. It's what's in the IPCC reports. It's They all talk about system change. They don't just talk about behavioral change. They don't just talk, and they don't talk about population control. They talk about actual system change. And what they're really saying, of course, right, is that capitalism and endless growth, you know, which one feeds the other, can't, can't go yeah. on. You know, it has to stop. If there's any chance of actually keeping this planet inhabitable for a long stretch of time. Yeah, and, and I think what this film highlights with that is something that I've been kind of trying to play around with, which is the idea that at the core of it, like there's an ontological view of how we think the world works. Mm-hmm. And liberals, conservatives, radicals, we all have different kind of beliefs that kind of go back and forth. But what we see is denialism emerges whenever reality does not match with our ontological claim of how mm-hmm. the world functions. Mm -hmm. And we all understand that conservative denialism, right? Because they just flat out reject that this is happening. Like that is like the most clear case. But I think what we don't pay attention to is the traditional liberal denialism, which is, oh, this is just an engineering problem. Like they admit that climate change is happening, but they do not comprehend the scope of it. They intentionally and willfully ignore the actual logic and the numbers involved. I mean, just watch the Democratic Party discuss climate change and you'll see it in spades. I mean, yeah. and it, to me, it, it's a actually very, it's a flip side of the same denialism of modern conservatism. Like, yeah, yeah. it's the same thing, just like a different form of denial. One denies the entire science, the other one denies the entire logic of the consequences. The problem that we're speaking about, yeah. and I think this is why the film is so controversial, the problem mm-hmm. that we're speaking about is so large. Yes. That it actually encompasses all, all spectrums of, of political thought and action, you know, it's just, and even all levels of consumerism and everything. I mean, it's just all, there's nobody alive that can't, that, that isn't going to be affected by this. So it actually requires a response that, that is across all of those kind of yep. mythical dividing lines. And it has to require a complete break or a shift away from a dominant hegemonic ideology that's been around for hundreds of years i mean since the fall of feudalism basically yeah pretty much i mean this is and and they're not willing to do it the same people who have benefited the most from the narrative of endless growth and rational liberal economics are the same people in charge and they would have to first of all admit their wrongness which people yeah. psychologically seem to have a hard time with yeah but they'd also have to give up their position of power in a certain way yeah yeah you know and that's not going to happen either well i mean uh-huh. wall street requires this is, this is michael moore right you know in mm-hmm. his i don't know if you got a chance to watch uh on uh, that show rising on the hill uh it's crystal no i didn't crystal no. what's her name crystal ball and and uh, i know her but i haven't kind of a fanboy it. of her i have to say um, you know, I, I like that she's uh, she kind of speaks out against the mainstream as much as she does. Yeah. Um, but they had she had um, all the producers of the film and Michael Moore on, which was interesting to kind of speak to the to some of the critiques. And at the end, Michael Moore was pretty straight up and said, "Wall Street requires that every business grow from year to year." So the idea was, you know, he's saying, look, it's not even enough that they grow one year and do really well. They have to then grow more the next year. So it's actually built into the the idea of doing business in the United States and much of the world is that you have to do more business every single year. You have to consume more. And, you know, the rest follows from that. And he said, I think the word enough is the dirtiest word in capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I was like, wow, you know, how many times have you seen anybody famous, but, you know, but, uh, but somebody make a documentary, you know, of, of his stature 
who's willing to go on a, a relatively popular show and say such things, right? Yeah, very um, so few. something has changed. This movie is definitely having an effect, you know, in yeah, on and, discussion. And again, you see the same issue come up with a lot of the criticisms of the film. Mm -hmm. Again, some of the criticisms are beyond valid. Um, oh, yeah, but others are, are really just ideological. Like, this is the one from Yale's Climate Connections. So I'm gonna, this is just from the conclusion. Um, and I'll kind of skip a little bit, but he goes, Gibbs asks, quote, is it possible for machines made by industrial civilization to save us from industrial civilization? Their response, why not? Industrial civilization has a non-zero climate and fi environmental footprint. And then later on in the next paragraph, they go, the filmmakers call for an end to limitless economic growth and consumption. It is difficult to envision that goal being achieved anytime soon, but even if it is, human civilization will continue to exist and require energy. And then they just kind of go in roughly, roughly saying, you know, this argument that the problem they have with it is it's frankly making the claim that, we need to end con growth and, and endless growth and consumption. And their response is, yeah, that's not going to happen. So let's start from the premise of this is what, this is the world we have. And this is what we're going to always have. <laughs> well, it's like they're channeling Frederick Jameson and saying, you know, what, what did he say? Was it, um, it's, it's easier to imagine, imagine the, the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Right. And Yale is right now the Yale climate science solutions is, is roughly saying that exact thing. Yeah. Like the yeah. problem with this film is that it makes a claim that they're not saying is incorrect, but does not seem probable right. in the current environment. And therefore and, we should discount it. And it's clearly not right. It's, uh -huh. it's, it's not probable, but let's, and, and this is, you know, Jeff Gibbs said, I wanted to spark a holistic discussion about all the things we humans are doing, you know, so he's, he's, he's again, not really actually talking about, you know, uh, he doesn't, you know, contrary to what a lot of people are saying in my view, anyway, it doesn't seem like they're falling into this sort of anti-humanist, you know, humans mm -hmm. as the bully species kind of, uh, argument. What they're really saying is that there are these systems under which we are all living and uh and it's causing us to think and behave and act and and plan in certain ways and that's what has to be dealt with yeah and i think I mean, part of the reason that if i think at the core if a nice like the best and nicest reading does kind of end with that mm -hmm. um i think there is this myopic focus on the u.s that mm, makes that yeah. narrative seem harder to see because it talks about humans as a whole but then only fixates on the most advanced economically advantaged and politically powerful mm -hmm. and then keeps using the language humans in a way that makes it feel like oh well what we do is the same as what's going on in you know rural india or china you know it just kind of blankets it and then just focuses on a very specific like they don't go to the global level i feel like by focusing only on the U.S., but talking... I mean, this is the same thing I have troubles with the entire Anthropocene narrative, mm -hmm. is it, it doesn't... It makes a claim that I think you're right. Systemically in the industrial countries, that's, this is the problem, and we're the ones leading the problem. So it requires systemic change here to address it, but then the narrative becomes global only in certain ways without mm -hmm. looking at the systems of exploitation fully it does yeah. a little bit of it through these cool montages well cool is maybe the wrong word but brutal <laughs> montages of like yeah. the mining yeah. aspect needed to make fossil fuels yeah which is, yeah. is completely and utterly erased from the narrative of fossil or from of renewable energy sorry so yeah. you know you completely remove the narrative of the lithium needed oh, to make oh, batteries oh right yeah <laughs> um, and so yeah. which the movie does bring up a little bit about but they don't actually talk about that much about exactly. where it actually comes from and what kind of isms you know uh -huh. put that situation in, in mm -hmm. to work for capital and, you know? and what are the colonial legacies of those resource extraction right. industries like right the lithium trade is not removed from you know u.s and european imperialism in 
Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Right, right. You know, right. And, <laughs> and this is an old ass story. It goes all the way back yeah. to the to the beginning of capitalism when when the you know the British were going into the South America and bringing back bird shit. You know, uh-huh. uh, well, it's exactly <laughs> it's, that. It's, <laughs> and it's just the modern version of it. Like it, it keeps changing. Yeah. But they by avoiding those conversations, I think that they end up making what I think you're right is at the core, they're making an argument, this requires systemic change. Mm-hmm. That's the main claim. It turns it into a sense that all humans are in this together instead of seeing that there's actually systems of coercion that make, for instance, the developed world doing to make do this, you yeah. know, or. And all humans like are in it together, but we're not all in it playing the same role. I saw a meme recently and it feels like now culture functions around the meme, but it said like, we're not all in the same boat. We're in the same storm. And I think that is Mm, exactly the great, that's the right framing. We're not in this boat together, but the storm, we definitely are. Yeah. A lot of us have some pretty rack, pretty rickety boats. Uh Uh-huh. And others have some pretty sweet cruise ships. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know, even, I, you know, this guy, Ozzy, right? You know, the, mm-hmm. the, the sort of center of the film, the, the, the yeah. PhD postdoc, I guess. Um, you know, I mean, he, I mean, he's pretty stark, this guy, you know, I mean, he's, he's mm-hmm. just very, you know, um, he's, he's, he said the existing environmental movement is going to be the, the last to come around to the story in this film. Of course, the the left side of the environmental movement which you and i are both i would say are a part of are also a little bit up in arms about like god damn it you know this is this is the part that makes me want to stand on the on the mountain that's about to be you know removed and scream why another fucking anti-humanist you know it's like what is wrong with you people you know you know it's like why didn't they take the opportunity to you know uh you know to to just really call it out you know and really talk about how we are not in the same boat together how this is a systematic issue worldwide and that is not just about america and that it's not just about you know green energy it's about so many other things and you know and green energy just being a piece of that it I mean, one film can't do it all, you know, no. on one hand, but on the other, boy, I mean, just a couple of nods in a few different directions, you know, what about degrowth, you know, you know, just exactly. various things like that were just not even mentioned, you know, you know, it's like you oh. took all this time and made this movie and you didn't mention these very basic things, which would have calmed a lot of us down, I think. And there's kind of, and similar to like the erasure of difference amongst humans, there's an erasure of difference among environmentalists right yes they kind of make the claim that the environmental yeah. which is not true talk to water defenders yeah. on indigenous land talk to right. earth first radicals talk or to anyone that deals with environmental justice feels totally exactly. left out of that movie they com- i mean it's they didn't even bother to chat with any of the countless amazing environmental activists who are fighting environmental justice in mm. urban areas i mean there's yeah. some amazing Flint water people. crisis for God's sakes. I mean, there's that. There's Richmond's oil refinery. Yes. Uh, anti oil refinery groups. Yes. That are almost all black and Latino folks in mm-hmm. Oakland and Richmond. I mean, yeah. you have countless examples of yeah. people who do not buy the renewable is the salvation right. argument. And who never did. Who really yeah. never did because they never saw it affect their communities in, in even the, re- the remotest possible way. Yeah, it's like the farthest left understanding of environmentalism there is um, 350.org, which is not, not, I mean, it's an important. Long past, by way. the way. You know, we're, we're, yeah. we're we at four, four something, 420 almost. I mean, yeah, they're going to have to, they're going to have to raise it to 450.org, I guess. <laughs> like, but, yeah. But I mean, I can't even remember the last time I've even heard anyone mention 350.org, you know, as being yeah. the centerpiece of the modern environmental movement. I mean, for yeah. all its problems, Extinction Rebellion is a bigger name now. Yeah, and, and, and arguably has, has made way more of an impact in a certain sense. You know, you yeah, know, it I mean, has than... some of the same issues, but it also they are not focusing just on renewable energy. Their main thing is on drastically reducing production and consumption. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. And so it's like the narratives have shifted yeah. intensely 
Yeah. And part of this is that this film took how many, eight years to make? They collected this this footage over a long period of time because mm-hmm. both him and Moore have worked together, you know, for... Yeah. I don't think they put a whole lot of thought. They probably just figured, I, you know, sometimes when you, you know, as someone who works on a podcast and does a whole lot of editing, I understand that feeling that you get at a certain point. And you're like, I got to push the, I got to push the button on this thing. I got to pull the trigger. Otherwise I'm never going to get done. You know, and and part, maybe and it was one of those things. And especially when you're talking about climate change or renewable energy technology, it's moving fast. Perhaps this is as good a time as any to remind everybody to take a moment and uh, go subscribe to the podcast at Spotify, at Spreaker, at Breaker, at any of the places where you happen to see the words burnt out in Budapest. I hope you're enjoying the conversation so far. And if you're enjoying it, uh, another thing that you can do if you want to actually really support the program is you can become a supporter. You can do that at anchor.fm where you look up the podcast, Burnt Out in Budapest, and you can become a supporter. Any amount of money actually helps this podcast become that much better, helps me buy some new equipment, helps me find the extra time, actually, necessary to make this podcast a more regular occurring thing. In addition to that, uh, you can also become a patron of the podcast at patreon.org and over there you can uh you can actually what comes with uh donating there is that you actually get to have a say in what we do here at the podcast so have a look at the website patreon.org forward slash burnt out in budapest and see if there's something there that you would like to participate in in the meantime, I'm going to go back to the back to our conversation. And one quick quick note: um, I do apologize for any audio discrepancies that may happen. Um, we did have an issue with uh, with my microphone actually at the time, so there's a few sections of the interview that uh, where I sound a little more distant than I normally would. In any case, um, hopefully you can hear everything well and the editing was done at a high enough level that uh, everything is quite clear. Without further ado, let's go back to the conversation. So a lot of the criticisms that are 100% correct talk about the literal misunderstanding of where renewables are now. Like, they're way more efficient. They use less resources in these regards. You know, all that is true, and so that becomes an easy target to say, well, they have all the wrong, you know, they're talking about 2012, not 2020. Yeah, so which they is discount right the in, entire movie as a result of that fact. Which is right in the, like, the meta or the macro understanding of a like, percentage, you know, efficiency. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mm-hmm. get at the core question, which is, what is the environmental logical impact of maintaining the same system of economic growth with renewables? Yeah, yeah, and that, and so they're avoiding the discussion on that part, yeah. on the radical need to change our entire social, political, economic system, by focusing on the small mistakes or increased changes in efficiency for renewables, for instance. In some ways, as I'm thinking about it now, it sort of reiterates, it reifies that argument. Uh, that techno that op, that techno optimist kind of argument because th- they're essentially saying look we just need to wait a little longer you know you know the, they're not giving it enough credit we've made so many advances and you know it's we are we'll going to have so that many more. city on the hill in the future that's more sustainable and you know you know and the movie they're trying to say look no you're not you're not going to have that you, th- th- we're going to have to have something completely different you know, it may involve green energy, but I think it will have to. It's going to have way. to, right? You know, but but come on, people. You know, it it we put trillions of dollars into it, and it's not. We're actually worse off now, yeah, than we I mean, were before. Let's face let's face the reality that we're in, right? And all you have to take is they've been like the claim is, oh, look at how much we've improved, and all you have to do is look at the increase in greenhouse gas emissions during that same time that they've claimed we've improved so drastically. Yeah. That hockey stick does not change at all. (laughs) So great. We're more efficient, but we're actually, you know, what is it? Um, 
what what's the, um what's the economic theory around efficiency um oh god uh oh uh you know, um joe jovan's paradox yeah 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 the, the, yeah it's, uh, it's jones, that literally yeah, jones paradox. literally in practice right you have increased efficiency not lead to decreases in consumption but yeah. allows us to consume more at a right. more efficient rate yeah but we're more efficient consumers now we we dirty the planet less when we buy shit now but, but, we buy more. but we buy more shit. So it's all completely yeah. negated, you know, or made worse. Actually, we may find exactly. that it's not negating anything at all. I mean, and, and that's one point where the, where the population argument does come in, you know, speaking yeah. as a geographer that teaches eighth graders about population dynamics and, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, we do study that the reality is that there, there is a, a carrying capacity to the earth, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, and we all know this and we're all aware of it. But we know that that's not the story, right? Like the story is that it's it's the distribution of the population. It's who's rich and who's poor and why they're rich and why they're poor and why the population rises in some places and doesn't. And why we have a population problem in, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, but not in Seattle, Washington, right? Exactly. Yeah. And it also misunderstands because it focuses, if you focus on population, instead of capitalism yeah. the argument has to be that the reason capitalism emerged is because populations grew when it's actually mm. the inverse it's the, the wow that's a great point yeah. because yeah. capitalism developed and needed labor to accumulate value yeah so even if population is a problem which i think most people will argue you know there's you know if everyone consumed like the west in that oh, yeah. number, yeah. of course. Yeah. But to say, oh, well, we need to draw population without focusing primarily on capitalism, colonialism, and all these other legacies, it misses the core problem. Yeah. It, it, it allows you to have the illusion that, you know, if we had less population, maybe we can maintain capitalism in a way that functions. If 2 billion people die tomorrow, and God, I hope it doesn't happen, right? And we maintain the same economic system, the population is going to go back. Yeah. Because the economic yeah. system requires that growth. Yeah. Growth of capital requires the growth of populations. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. so, and the same probably is the inverse. If you radically change your economic system, the incentive structure for cultures and societies and individuals to have massive populations should go down. And you yeah. will hopefully see, you know, shifts over time too. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. it, it just goes back to the, you know, infinite growth on a finite planet is suicide, exactly. period. End of story, mm -hmm. right? You know, and, and, yeah. and everything, not just population, consumption, you know, uh -huh. everything. And, it, and you can say, oh, well, if you just cut the population, if that's the growth that's problematic, not the growth that comes mm -hmm. from consumption and materialism and production. Right. right. That's become, to me, that's always the problem. It's not necessarily yeah. that population is not, quote unquote, an issue. Yeah. It's that it's r roughly f blaming the wrong target. It's like yeah, yeah. you know you're in you know you're in Budapest. It's blaming the social crisis on migrants instead of the actual yeah. cause. Like the or even in, in even in my case here in Budapest, yeah. the average Hungarian in terms of their you know if you want to use I know it's a crude metric, but the you know the ecological footprint you know yeah. the, the ecological footprint of a of of a, of an average Hungarian mm -hmm. is one seventh. The, econo the, the ecological footprint of the average American. Wow. One seventh. You know, that in China, it's one tenth. You know, so, yeah. so when you're really looking at it from these <laughs> perspectives, it's like it, it just disproves the population argument even more because uh -huh. it's not about more people. It's about, you know, where the resources are being distributed and how they're being distributed. Uh -huh and how they're being consumed and, and reproduced. And one of the other issues that comes up when you focus on population, in my mind, is if you think of what is to be done, you know, that, that Lenin yeah. kind of question, yeah. the, the, the source of the environmental crisis is, is women's wombs. Yeah, exactly. And therefore, right. you, what you have is wow. yeah. the desire to regulate and control social reproduction in a way that Sylvia Federici talks about as yeah. central to capitalist exploitation. Internally, you know, you know demonizing uh -huh. the feminine. Exactly. And so, again, and, and again, it's, it's not even finding the right target. 
So it's, it's allowing you to kind of, like the way I've been thinking about a lot of this film is it rightfully undermines the illusion of renewable energy, mm-hmm, but it mm-hmm. often replaces it with the illusion of population. As, yes. As the and I don't and remember so it, what, which, re- which response to the movie I was reading when I saw that, but that was one of the more cogent, yeah. you know, critiques. And I think, there's the a truth, I think there's a truth there. And I think it's not because they focus a ton on population. They don't, actually. No, it's no. They, they don't even use the phrase then, population control or anything like that in no. the film, actually. But they talk about population kind of randomly. It's kind of weirdly located in the film. And then they provide no other discussion on yeah. what is to be done with the old made- guy right in the beginning of the this is one of the things that just immediately pissed me off was right in the beginning of the film of all the places in the world where they can be where are they in vermont with a bunch of white people older white people bunch walking older, around in the mountains you know wearing 150 dollar <laughs> parkas and shit you uh-huh. know you know and they're and they and and the white guy says we've got to do something about this overpopulation all of us have to cut back you know, uh-huh. and it's just like, you know, why don't you just say we got to go around the world and, and, and get rid of all those brown people that are causing the rest of us to have problems. Yeah. And it, it comes. So my friend, Emily, it's, not and us, I, it's you, them, you know, you know, Emily, I'm sure. I yeah, mean, yeah. 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 So her and I have a piece in capitalism, socialism and nature that I really love on um, looking at the tar sands and looking at narratives of sustainability that the tar sands companies use, like, one of the mm. things people don't realize in Canada, the tar sands industries are part of the sustainability index for their, da- for their equivalent of the Dow. And so the question we ask is <laughs> sustainability is a worthless term. The question needs yeah. to be what is being sustained and for whom? Yeah, exactly. And there's not enough and, accounting of that in general. And this guy is, what he's saying is I want to maintain my existence and way of life. Mm-hmm. So what I want sustained is my way of life. Yeah. And who's, who's that going to benefit me? Who's that going to hurt? Well, I think we need to focus on the people who are overpopulating, which yeah. is always not them. Which is always right? the poor people. It's the brown people. Uh-huh. It's the downtrodden of the world. It's the, uh-huh. you know, pick your... And so we argue that instead of giving, like, focusing on sustainability, which we argue is a worthless term, frankly, yeah. it needs to be structured around justice. Yeah, yeah. Like instead of having a concern for, oh, we need to have a sustainable planet. We need to have a just planet, period. 100% agree with that. Like, uh, yeah, that I mean, because there's all always things. an uncomfortable thing that with me, I feel like, yeah. and, I, and I'm sure we can agree on this. When we talk about sustainability, that's always been uncomfortable for me. I, because I, I grew I, up poor. I grew up shit program. poor. I didn't have any choice yeah. about what I was going to you know like i mean it was just you got what you could get you know you know i mean it it was it's an elitist idea to to live sustainably but to live justly now that is something that can go across race and class and and gender and everything right if it's totally done in a in a, a a reflexive kind of way yeah i mean i teach in a one of the i teach in a sustainability program it's mm-hmm. It's not exactly the same because it's sustainable communities and we intentionally have yeah, the communities yeah. part. Yeah. And we regularly have grad students come in. They're expecting it to be a sustainability program. And one of the things we've devised is the first two classes they take are primarily focused on history of racism, history of patriarchy, history of colonialism, and, and the logic of capitalism. Yeah. And then, and they're always like, why are we talking about like, white supremacy like shouldn't we be learning about you know exactly what this film talks about yeah. shouldn't we be well, learning about understand you know, <laughs> solar panels like isn't that more important to sustainability than knowing the legacy of white supremacy and then talking about democracy like yeah, yeah. wow that's brilliant the, i wish all sustainability programs started that way yeah and then by the end of it almost universally the students are like oh we get it and yeah. we're happy we did that yeah. But they yeah. almost universally come in with the perspective of why are we talking about slums of Aspen? Why are we yeah. reading that right now? It's, it, they think it's going to be puppy dogs and ice cream talking about the beautiful future and forgetting about the ugly present, you know, and exactly. the past, right? And it's tough because they also get incredibly depressed during that first yeah. year. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, 
frankly, I think you should be depressed. I mean, if you're not depressed, there's something wrong. You kind of have to work <laughs> right through that. It's, it's sort of part of the, it's, yeah. it's part, I work, I work with uh, mostly kids who are between the ages of like um, 12 and 18. Right. Yeah. And we do, we spend a lot of time talking about global inequality and, you know, you know, the, Greta Thunberg and you know I mean we've we go through all of it all the time and and the first thing that I always have to deal with is seeing that look on their face right the that look mm -hmm. of res resignment you know it's like well what what can we do about it you know and I said mm -hmm. and that's the beauty of it right is when you get them to that point when they when you're able to actually admit that this is a really yeah. bad situation this is not we are not in a good situation the world is not in a good place my future is not set it, no. uh, i don't have a whole lot to say about my future right now you know you know and in so fact, once you're at that point that you can get into something you can do something and feel optimistic because you're actually accepting the reality of the moment and there's zero chance that their future is going to look like they're present. Yeah, I, I have to tell them that all the time. There's no guarantee that, that, that this level of living that you're at is going to be maintained. You better be able to think really creatively, really entrepreneurially, and critically. Yeah, I mean, I always, one of, I have a friend or um, a family friend who asks, oh, do you have like a retirement plan? And I kind of just laugh <laughs> at this idea that there's going to be a concept of retirement. Yeah, like, yeah that you can plan for like in this moment yeah, yeah. like the future is going to be so stable that i could have a plan for retirement i'm like no no no, no. that's not i'm literally just trying to get by i mean yeah even university professors we're frankly not making as much as people no. think either. no like, no people you're think you're living on a you know on a, you have a golden nugget but you you know not really i mean quality of life of maybe work you guys put in it's <laughs> insane i mean you know people people have no clue yeah quality of life for sure is great but it's like i have no sense that any form of retirement plan that the university has is going to function when i get there there's yeah, zero yeah, a zero yeah, chance yeah, to that yeah. for me and this you is know? and this is you know even though it's you know we took an we took a different avenue there it, yeah. it's still related to the film because the thing that the film gets us to think about right is that this situation that we're in is not going to be fixed because you know by future tripping basically you know you know we we need to you know i don't know to say if we need to present trip if you will right you know yeah. we need we need to actually deal with the really existing as john as our friend our mutual friend uh john barry you know brilliantly said in his book met many years ago now the we have to deal with the actually existing unsustainability of the present Yep, you know, and that and is a great book. Man, He's, you know, that is an amazing book. Uh, everybody really should is. read that, by the way. And I mean, I think that in part is the biggest reason for the negative backlash. Is it yeah. highlights the real existing unsustainability of even the quote-unquote sustainability movement? Right, right. And that makes people. You know, going to like one of the issues, you know, it goes to the question of hope, like yes. that, yeah. that people have. Like, I read um, Rolling Stone published, um, oh, what's the guy from 350.org? My brain just. Oh, forgot. McKibben. Bill McKibben. McKibben's yeah. response. Yeah. And, and there's some parts of it that are legitimately, again, with all this, he goes into some of the factual claims, 100%. Yep. Frankly, this yep. misstates some of his statements on biomass and things like that, which, right, right. sure, I'm willing to accept that claim. Yeah. But at the end of the day, he, he, he makes the argument that I think is, he w correctly hit it, but I think he's on the wrong side of it, that at the end of the day, this film is the difference between hope and nihilism. Mm -hmm. Where Gibbs is the nihilist and he is the arbiter of hope. And I'm like, yeah, actually, that's exactly right. The problem is, the, I, the hope that you have is for the continuation of the present, which, frankly, you should not have. Yeah, but the I, present is in a bad place. Like, if you look at the original political nihilists in Russia, which, who, are, who I consider to be the better arbiters of what nihilism is than, like, the Nietzschean tradition. Oh, interesting. Like, they're fascinating. They're totally worth looking into. really in need fact, to read some of that stuff, actually. In fact, um, Lenin's What is to be Done is based off the title of 
his favorite book, which is written by one of the Russian nihilists. Oh. It's literally titled as What is to be Done. And he read it multiple times when working on the book, What is to be Done. Huh, interesting. And it's a fictional book. Um, but at the end of the day, what they claimed was what we are nihilist about is the current order has zero reason to exist. And yeah. we believe there is no po- future and no hope within the logic of the present. Mm-hmm. And so we mm-hmm. wish to destroy the present, not because we don't think there can be something that happens after the present, but because the present is effectively unsustainable. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. we will go after every institution of the present to take it down. It's really interesting. This is <laughs> it's in a completely different way. But my my conversation that I had um, and this is actually on my most recent episode where mm. the second part of my interview with Adam Klugman, um, mm. he used to be he used to be somebody who crafted messages for the Democratic Party, right? Like like the kind oh, of ad man sort of, you know. Mm. And one of the things that he's gotten to the point of thinking now is very similar in a sense, but but he couches it very differently. But he says like until we as a as a society even as a species realize that our future is totally dependent on interdependence like the lesson Mm -hmm. for the future is interdependence Mm -hmm. and if we don't deal with that right now none of this other shit is going to matter it won't matter who becomes president it's not going to matter who's in the courts it's not going to all this shit is Mm -hmm. a smokescreen for the real issue at hand which is we have lost the 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 sense of ind- of interdependence that human beings have to have in order to be sustainable in any way, yeah. right? And so it's kind of a more of a spiritual take, but the nihilists, you know, to a, to a certain degree, we're kind of spiritual in that sense too. But Yeah, I mean, and to me, I think both of them are right. The discussion over hope that seems to dominate within the liberal tradition, but also yeah. increasingly like a lot of the Marxists yeah. is is predicated on again, that ontological worldview and the sense that their worldview is not wrong. It is the world that is wrong and they could remake the world to fit their, their, their view. Yeah. Instead yeah. of in that moment, destroying the quote unquote hope is actually a positive thing because it breaks people from that tradition of, Oh, how I live now has to be how I'll live forever. Yeah. And it's depressing and they probably will have to go through some stuff but at the end of the day, if you, I mean, if you pay attention even to like Buddhism, mm-hmm. like you don't avoid the darkness of the world. In, no, in, samsara, in man. Everybody exactly. suffers. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So if yeah. you focus on that and work through it and come to the terms of, yeah, everything suffers. Everyone suffers. It allows you an actual space to live actively in the present in a way that is yeah. meaningful. And yeah. it's to me the same thing with environmentalism. If you're com- completely under the pretense that somehow, you know, enough solar panels will allow us to maintain a capitalist economic relationship, you're never going to be able to live in the moment because you're going to be structured by the fear of the future. Yeah. Like you yeah. can't live in the present because you've not come to terms with the suffering that is inherent in the world that you live in. You know, that's something being somebody who lives in Budapest, you know, and, and is, you know, and I've been here a year now and, and, uh, and I was traveled here many times before. Mm-hmm. And one of the things about the Hungarians that's really interesting is they're kind of known for being, they're usually perceived as kind of dark, right? You know, mm-hmm. um, but once you get to know them, you realize it's not really that they're dark. It's that they're very, they're sort of pensive, you know, and they mm-hmm. are not afraid to really acknowledge the the shittiness of the moment you know at any given time you know like there's a when i first got my job i was i was explained something you know from somebody which another what another american that works there and he was telling me he said look you know when you first get there no one's gonna like talk to you normally you're not you're not gonna Mm -hmm. like no one will accept you until you until you've entered the grieving circle (laughs) it's the way that he talked about and he said what it was was like you had to stand with the other teachers outside the the building one day when they're all smoking or whatever and and Mm -hmm. you have to like really gripe about the world about the job about the government about you know Mm -hmm. until you earn the right to gripe you know to 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 
to bemoan the moment, you know, you know, with the other Hungarians, you know, then they won't fully accept you. It's like, if you're like the American, that's always sort of everything is rosy, even though it's deep inside, I'm dark as hell, you know, it's like, um, they, don't, they just wear it right on their sleeve. They're not afraid to to do that, you know, and there's a real beauty in that. And, and it's, uh, you can see it in the literature. It's the same with Russians too, right? You know, it's a whole Eastern European, yeah. like, and not just there, like, if you look at like Japan and China and mm -hmm. India. Yeah. Well, and again, all, the Buddhist tradition is totally yeah, accepting of, of. Exactly. Those, so, yeah. I mean, it's really the U S and Western Europe that have this fully like in, fully ingrained in their culture. Yeah. Like, yeah. I just rewatched Snowpiercer recently. Oh, I, you've mentioned that movie several times and I finally watched it again. It's, I it's love great. that movie. And uh, the line that is there, and I feel like this is at the core of American identity, is we have the misplaced optimism of the doomed. Oh, yeah. And such I a think powerful, that such structures powerful the entire American yeah. culture yeah. is we can't reject you know, this optimistic narrative of American exceptionalism or capitalist exceptionalism or yeah. this narrative that we're somehow the quote unquote best nation on earth, which is categorically not true. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. In any, any metric. Choose yeah. a metric. We're not. Yeah. Not yeah. True. Yeah. We're no, yeah. We're at the top for only the bad shit, basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And there's some stuff that is great about living here. Yeah, of course. Here, but the, the geography, I mean, look where you live. You know, that's, that's what I always tell people here. Like, what do I miss about America? Okay. I miss the mountains, the ocean, the desert. The, you know, that's the, that's the stuff that I miss the most. I mean, yeah. yeah and it's not the government it's no. not like not the, the economy economic not system. paying two thousand month dollars a month for rent you know no no I don't all that so. stuff no but i mean i live in one of the prettiest places i think in the world it's yeah. it's definitely up there oh yeah, yeah. Um, i feel like so i feel like at the core of it mckibben is right in his on his analysis of the film it's a tension that exists within the environmental movement between hope and either pessimism or nihilism yeah. and i think it's something similar that we see with the criticism of tanahasi coates's work i love because yeah. coates himself kind of refers to himself as being more in line you could see him as being more in line with the afro-pessimist tradition versus yeah. Yeah. cornell yeah. west which is definitely this like black optimist narrative yeah yeah and so at the end of the day, he comes across as being like, there's nothing we could do about the legacy of white supremacy without burning down this entire thing. And yep, that's a hundred percent true. Yeah. And yeah. like, Barack and even Obama if it wasn't true, it's solving. something that needs to be considered, you know, you know, it yeah. at least has to be fully considered. Yeah. And I mean, I, and I feel like a lot of the same issues with, I don't, have you read much of the Afro pessimist stuff? You know, I haven't read a lot of it. I read a little bit though, and one of my one of my best friends actually, um, the rapper from the band I used to play in Junkyard Empire, um, uh, his name is Brian Lozensky, and he's actually a PhD at. Um, you might really like his work. The two of you should probably hook up. He works at uh, McAllister. Is it McAllister? Yeah, McAllister College in uh, Minnesota. And, um, oh. and he's been getting really into the Afro pessimist, um, like, and we actually talked about trying to write an article together about the Anthropocene and that's awesome. kind of bringing the Afro pessimist viewpoint into the discussion a little bit more. There's like a similar core component there that I think is both right and wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. So at the core of Afro pessimism is the claim that ontologically anti-blackness is the structure is the ontological structure of modernity. I mean, mm -hmm. they go, some of them go even further of civilization yeah. as a whole. Yeah. And therefore there is no anti, there is no pro black politics that can emerge under our ontological world. Right. Right. And I the, think the, the a, basic reality that we live doesn't allow for that to be mm -hmm. true. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a truth to that. But the same thing that happens with this movie, which makes kind of a similar claim around civilization and the right. destruction of the environment, is it provides no way of analyzing the shifts in politics. So why yeah. did, why did um, you know, how has Europe developed and grown and how did colonialism emerge and how has all these different traditions and structures happened? Mm -hmm. It can provide no answer because it's all, all just, well, it's because ontologically Europe was anti-black. 
Right. So again, it leaves you with this. So what do we do? We just off ourselves or, or, or do we, you know, or do we, you know, what do we do again? Right. What is to be done? And at the end of the day, their argument is you need to burn it. It's kind of the nihilist argument. You need to just destroy the present for there to be a possibility of a future. Yeah. And, and I don't necessarily disagree with it, but I feel like both of them are missing an analysis of the fact that capitalism, power dynamics, like all these things operate in way more nuanced ways than just pure ontology. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's things like ownership, you know, like I'm always talking right now, I'm working with my students on that. Actually, we're talking about means of production and private and public property and, you know, you know, these kind of things. And, and listening to a bunch of, you know, 14 year olds try to understand what's at stake, you know, when (laughs) workers own the means of production versus like, owners of capital own the means of production and they, they're slowly piecing it together and, and they're starting to see it's like, Oh, okay. So Jeff Bezos is of the world would not even be possible, you, you know, under that kind of situation. So, you, you know, that's a, it's another nuanced way to think about it is just, you know, there's all these individual aspects of society that, that get kind of washed out with both the Anthropocene argument and sort of this also that what you're talking about with this, the kind of Afro pessimist situation also doesn't leave room for the option to say, well, what if the ownership structure of society was to be forced to be different? Yeah. And the the same thing like the Afro pessimists is they ignore like the entire tradition of like the race trader politics. Mm -hmm, It starts mm -hmm. with John Brown. Yeah. And maybe there's something there where you can actually radically alter the dynamic of, of race and capital yeah. in ways that open up possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. And it's still yeah. maybe the death of the world, the present. And that's, I think that's yeah. where I think they're right. Yeah. Is we need to see, see the present as a moment of unsustainable crisis that needs to stop. You know, maybe that's just an, a, a really solid way to sum up this movie, you know, is to yeah. say that, that the reason this movie is so unsettling for all of us, for you, for me, yeah. for, for a, a, a huge swath of the environmental movement, for people on all sides of the coins, the movie says in, in, in really in no uncertain terms, we have to kill the present in order to yeah. um, find a way forward. Because and, even and the scary. makers of the movie say, we don't have the answers. We didn't even try to have the answers. All we are able to do is say, this shit is not working. And, and that point, they're 100% correct, right? right. <laughs> um, and anytime you get into the conversation, oh, well, what's the blueprint for the future? I mean, that's an impossible yeah. question. Well, even let's sit down and talk about it. That should be the answer to, you know. Exactly. To these it's things, democracy, right? <laughs> it's engagement, it's, yeah. it's community connections. It's all right. the things that we're lacking. Um, yeah. Yeah. But even if you look at Marx, he gets criticized regularly for not having an understanding of what communism will look like. And there's a reason for that. Yeah. How can yeah. you imagine a world that is ontologically radically different than the world you live in? It's well, like and I think Marx would fiction. probably respond and say that that it would be irresponsible for me to try to say to you what that's going to look like. You're supposed to plan what that's going to look like. <laughs> right? yeah, you are the workers, right? <laughs> and I'm structured by the ontology of the present. Anything I provide is going to be influenced by that narrative that I've lived with. Yeah. And when that narrative's gone... I'm not going to have any idea what the new narrative is going to be. It's like very Foucauldian in a way too. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I can see that too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, There's going to be a completely different world intellectually. Yeah. And we should not behold the future to the logic of the present means that I can't tell you what the present is. And that's partly been my love of science fiction too. It's, It's one of the few genres that says, well, let's try to imagine that. And, it doesn't and, succeed and it's always, so frequently it right, which is just uh-huh. disturbing as hell is like how many times I've read, you know, Isaac Asimov or, you know, or, or God forbid, Octavia Butler, you know, and, and it's like, you know, they just seem so freaking correct, you know, and it's maybe because they're considering the present so much. They're yeah. deconstructing I mean, the present and, and through that they can actually see what the future might look like and I don't know. We're supposed to read that and go, we better do something different. 
Yeah, like I read Parable of the Sower again um, recently, the, you know, the series of Octavia Butler. Yeah. And yeah. It one of my favorite present, series of all time, that, that series. Yeah, it calls the present better than anything I've ever seen. Like, I yeah. know people look to Margaret Atwood and Handmaid's Tale has that, mm-hmm. you know, has come up. This book blows that out of the water oh, yeah, in man. its predictive quality from like the yeah. Trumpian political figure using literally America first in the book. Yes, yes. To yeah. like a racial politics of death, to wildfires destroying California, mm-hmm. to the rise of neo, uh, neo feudalism and neo slavery. It can't be done necessarily easily through political theory or through yeah. political yeah. programs. It, it's a creative project. Yeah. And like all creative projects, especially political ones, they need to be collective. You know, maybe, maybe the, the lesson for, you know, Michael Moore is an, as an executive producer, i.e. bankroller, you know, and, um, mm-hmm. and Jeff Gibbs as a director and Ozzy Zinner as a producer, maybe the lesson yeah. in all of this is they need to make another movie like Lickety yep. Split. Like, like they need to, I hope they're on it already. And they need they need to make a rejoiner for this that addresses the visceral reactions that so many people rightfully had to the film mm-hmm. uh, and continuing to have to the film, but also address the visceral positive reactions that some people like us have also had to elements of the film. It's just yeah. another film is begging to be made that actually yeah. does get into what are the solutions and some of them we do know you know some of those solutions are changes in ownership structures you know uh, uh, environmental justice um, you know returning land to indigenous people you know I mean there's just a long list of things that absolutely have to happen if we're going to have any semblance of this thing we call sustainability whatever the hell that is you know and it's happening examples of it are happening everywhere and they could talk to people doing these experiments you could talk to like people doing amazing stuff in Detroit around Mm -hmm. like cooperative farming and housing and things like that. You could talk to to the water protectors. You could, I mean, there's so Mm. many countless examples of people doing really amazing work that is actual existing sustainability. (laughs) You can have the unsustainability. You got the the, the Cuban uh, uh, local government in in Havana, you know, is is paying citizens to grow organic vegetables in their front yards and in their alleyways and all this kind of stuff. You know, I mean, really interesting interesting alternatives happen when you are forced to engage in them. I mean, that's what Michael Moore, what was the one more thing that Michael, Michael Moore yeah. said that I really stuck with me when he was responding to critiques of the film. And he said, we are able to make serious fundamental changes in the way we live immediately if we think we are going to die. <laughs> and, this is, and this might be where my, like, my legacy of being involved in anarchism takes its most hit. Um, I think you're seeing that primarily with the dislocated the poor and the excluded Mm -hmm. like the industrial workers they're a little too comfortable yeah to be necessarily engaging in that fully but if you look at indigenous communities you look at like subsistence farmers throughout the entire world Mm -hmm. there's you know experiments going on of mutual aid and actual sustainable living that are amazing models yeah amazing hopes i mean that is where to me if there's hope it's there. Like, yeah. I have a nihilism towards our present, but a hope for these other examples of actual living. Yeah. That's something that I want to look into more as well. Like in my own work, yeah. and, you know, finishing up my dissertation, like the, there's the, the piece yeah. that I'm still trying to put together is the what now piece, you know, you know, and what, what does, you know, not just ending yeah. on, you know, we we're living through the, first mass extermination you know but you know what what does that mean you know and how does how does that theoretically get turned around you know you know or or could it be turned around and one of those areas that i imagine is mutual aid you know it's something that i had never thought about before but it's only through you know at least in those terms like thinking about these dislocated communities and anarchist you know thinkers you know who have been talking about this for you know 
Mm -hmm. two centuries now basically and one of the things that comes out of that is the rejection of this individualism that's at Mm -hmm. the core of most of the modern like philosophy because mutual aid inherently understands the interconnectedness of beings right right which goes to that what adam klugman was saying in 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 my other episode with him yeah yeah yeah. i think he's 100 percent right i mean what we're missing is that sense it's funny because we are interconnected and the pandemic highlights what interconnectedness means. Yes. But it's still not getting through the, the cultural zeitgeist of that this is what the pandemic shows. Yeah. Well, again, it's is that, that thing where people are being shown through this crisis, they're being shown truths that they don't want to acknowledge and therefore they push back on it. Their, their sort of survival mechanism is to kind of yeah. not acknowledge it, like what you kind of were referring to earlier. Yeah, it's kind of, I mean, if you look at the original meaning of what apocalypse, it means an, an, a revealing, right? Really? A revealing of oh, truth. I, I yeah. didn't know that. Wow. And so, like, the apocalypse is not the end of life. It's the re- revealing of, frankly, the contradictions that make the present non, non, you know, unsustainable in a way. Yeah. Huh. So, it, you know, so this can be a pandemic, can be an apocalyptic event that, you know, can be positive. Uh-huh, Apocalypse uh-huh. in the traditional sense is not inherently like negative. It's a moment of revelation. I mean, that's literally yeah. where the apocalyptic narrative in the Bible comes from. It's revelations. Another end like, of the world is possible, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's, I think, what we're so scared of because liberalism highlights this narrative of a never ending infinite of linear time. And mm-hmm. apocalypse is the end of that and a restart of something new. And I don't think it can conceptually understand that there are many worlds will exist in our, in our, in this planet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. When we zoom out and we, and we realize how uh-huh. small we are, we, we are forced to, to, to yeah. acknowledge those kind of truths too. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I do wish, I wish um, Michael Moore and Gibbs would read Jason Moore's work, honestly. I kind of wish they would too. I mean, you know, like Moore, you know, nobody's perfect, right? I mean, there's critiques yeah. that to, to give for Jason too, for Jason W. Moore. But um, for the, the listeners out there, we're, we're, we're referring to a book called um, Capitalism in the Web of Life. Um, and it's part of a world ecology type of uh, framework. And um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think this, the, the, the simple notion that him and Raj Patal are always working with is this, this idea of like making nature, nature cheap, right? Making nature work for capital. That's something uh-huh. I think people, the Michael Moores of the world could really do something with that. Like that mm-hmm. could easily be made into a blockbuster documentary, you know, you know totally. <laughs> to reach a lot totally. of people, you know. And even just his phrasing of the capitalist scene Mm -hmm. which again is not always perfect there's limitations to that sure it addresses frankly two-thirds of my criticisms of the film yeah yeah it does yeah yeah (laughs) i mean just that alone yeah that a narrative that framing i think if they took that framing instead of the anthropocene framing that is dominant i think you have an argument that is really powerful and really Mm -hmm. radical and really consistent yeah, yeah, I think so too. I think that movie that they need to make, <laughs> that new movie, yeah. <laughs> needs to be basically that, you know, however, whatever they call that or however they, you know, put it together, that's got to be the movie. You know, the next, the movie that has not been made yet, it maybe Naomi Klein might have got the closest so far, you know, you know, in terms of like kind of calling it out for what it really is, you know. Um, but, and I uh, think that's right. Naomi Klein's book, um, you know which one this changes everything i think this changes everything yeah is as pop popular books go is probably one of the best oh yes yeah yeah and i'm kind of surprised by her criticisms of the film um yeah and she was an early one too i mean she really like just came charging right out of the gates with that which is was a little shocking for me i was like Wow. When I heard that, it was like, okay, now I need to go and read the critiques. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I actually really respect her work. And, yeah. I, you know, and I think it's because the film, I think, aligns with her in some ways on the analysis. But it, since she focuses so much on 
mo counter movements and mm -hmm. these kind of examples. I think she's upset by the fact that it leaves kind of a, a taste of nothing. There's no part of the environmental movement that's not doing this. Right. I think, right. It, I think she's probably, she finds it uncomfortable that the focus here is to kind of erase difference in the environmental movement. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's targeting the wrong enemy in her mind. Like the enemy is fossil yeah. fuel capitalism, not necessarily Bill McKibben or the Sierra Club. Yeah. Well, she also might be mad about things that we brought up too, which is which just, you know, the absence of environmental justice and the absence of women's movements and the absence of, I mean, you know, all the things that she addresses, you know, in some of and her. He had, and they had so many opportunities. I mean, they have oh, a, endless a phenomenal interview with, uh, they have a phenomenal clip with uh, Vandana Shiva. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And go into what she's doing just for yeah, exactly. five minutes. Ask her a few like, more yeah. questions. I mean, like you got God, it. Yeah, I mean, she's brilliant. She's amazing, yeah, and yeah, doing yeah. exactly the work mm -hmm. that you're saying no one's doing. Yeah, right. Like, so talk yep. to her. I wonder <laughs> if he even realized who she was when I saw that film. I yeah. that I actually wondered when he was interviewing her. Does he realize? like what a heavy hitter she is like i don't know if he actually understood who he was talking to you know maybe he, he thought she was just one of the people at this conference and whatever you know but um, i mean probably she's definitely like not a, read her you know, yeah i doubt he really understood like the the depth of her thinking because if he did probably would have asked her a, a, a few more questions i think I feel like that's really the the missing. I, I think at the core of it, what he ended, up, what the problem of the film is, is it's so awash in American whiteness mm. that it misses everything else, top to bottom, man. I mean, and that is the problem with it. If yeah. and it's intellectually even right, it needs to just be. What they need to do is they need to engage with, you know frankly the environmentalism of the poor that exists well, throughout the people the world. who are the most affected yeah i mean white 100%. people are up in arms about it but it's not it's not white people overall that are being the most affected by it no in it's fact i don't connect in all of that the entire point of most white people's concern especially the wealthy white people is exactly what he says they're trying to sustain their position of of privilege yeah yeah and he Is that takes your meditation that as a, clock or something like that? <laughs> exactly. When, if you focus away from that and you focus on Vandana Shiva, black and indigenous folks, mm -hmm. poor working class white people in Appalachia, yes. there's like countless examples that completely change the narrative. It doesn't yeah. change the meta narrative of how... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know how to stop if, once you link up phones with computers. Yeah, it just goes hog wild, like you know, exactly. you everything in the world all at one time. Yeah, but if like, if you focus on those other components, all of a sudden, like your meta analysis is still 100% right, which is mainstream Western liberal environmentalism is a corporate controlled shill for yeah. capitalism. Yeah. I mean, it, the, speaking of the movement itself, it yeah. lives under the domination of the capitalist world system, just like everything else does right now. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it really maybe shouldn't surprise us at all that, that no, you know, it's, it's a profit driven system too. I'll share one quick story before we yeah. run out of time. I used to work a part of my history. I don't usually talk about this very much and hopefully I don't get sued for talking about this, but, but um, I used to work as a lobbyist, you know, uh, I did some lobbying, but it was, I guess you could say consultant, you know, in the sort of environmental legislation arena. Mm -hmm. Right. And at one point I was working for Pew, you know, Pew, um, the Pew Environmental Trust, but it was a, it was a, you know, kind of an offshoot of, of the Pew Charitable Trust. And we had this big kind of convention, you know, that not, well, not convention, but I'd say a large meeting um, where all of us organizers, I represented the state of Minnesota and there was like all the state kind of representatives of Pew were in the room at the same time. And we were there for, at one point, for this kind of messaging uh, lesson, if you will, you know, mm -hmm. where they had the kind of leaders of the organization up there and they were talking about the words and phrases that we should and shouldn't use 
when we go talk to like farmers because we were working on this uh, antibiotics and farm food campaign, right? You know, and it's like the words that we should and shouldn't use when we're talking about the environmental crisis and and all of the things connected, one of them being antibiotics and farm food, right? And uh, and the, and they said, and, and of all of the words that they told us never to use, the number one word was behavior. They say, don't use the word behavior. And the other one they said, don't use, don't use the word capitalism. Just strike it, just strike it from the record. Like whatever the conversation is you're going to have with somebody, don't talk about behavior and don't talk about capitalism. And of course, the, the Marxist in me, which I was already becoming at that time, but not yeah. quite there, but the, the kind of budding Marxist in me was like, the fuck is all that about? You know, you know like, we're not allowed to like, you know, explain things as they really are, I guess. You know, we have to, we have to give it to them on a, you know, we have to sneak the information in there because, you know, ultimately the goal is passing a bill. Right. You know, so they, yep. that's the way that the people in power think about these things. You can't don't challenge them on their behavior. Don't challenge them on the, the American idea of capitalism. You know, that won't get you anywhere. And yeah. so that's just I think that just shows you from the inside the belly of the beast at a meeting in Washington, D.C. At, at the one of the biggest environmental charities that have as a, ever existed. Right. Um, that's what they're telling us to say and not say so it really gets to the heart of why it's so hard to get the, the environmental movement to, to oh, yeah. realize the predicament that we're really in yeah it's so interesting it makes me think of uh, i have a coworker here who's really amazing scholar on political theory and rhetoric um mm -hmm. guy ira allen and he's gotten me convinced that one of the ways to frame some of this stuff is what you just highlighted is the absurd utopianism of pragmatism Oh, like, yeah. at this yeah. moment, pragmatism yeah. is the most utopian value. Yeah. And it's not like, necessarily Dewey's <laughs> pragmatism either. <laughs> no, it's not. It's, it, it roughly means, oh, the only way to solve this environmental crisis is to be pragmatic, which means that we don't talk about the actual core aspects of the environmental yeah. crisis. Because that will scare <laughs> the other people on the other side of the table away. Yeah, so what's the logic is what? That it will somehow magically fix it? That's super utopian. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. That's way more yeah. utopian than the person who's like, "We need to abolish capitalism." And and really privileged and pragmatic in right too. now. You know, it's sort of <laughs> it sort of puts it's, it's like to believe that you have to be in a position of total safety, you know, Completely. to believe that. You know. Yeah, it's in, yeah, and I think this film pushes against that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, that's part of the uncomfortableness with it. You know, yeah. some of that uncomfortableness so, is legit legitimate and some of it is really um, misplaced. <laughs> yeah. So maybe that's the way we should leave it is we should say, yeah. you know, so after our conversation, um, maybe unsurprisingly, um, we kind of we kind of ended where we started, which is that um, it, this film has a whole lot of issues, a whole lot of problems, um, uh, serious problems that are really worthy of the critiques that it's gotten. But um, at the same time, maybe not necessarily overshadowing the the critiques, but at the same time, there there is this work that the film does that is so incredibly necessary at okay. this at this moment, at this historical moment. Yeah, that sounds exactly right <laughs> to me. So I think we both ended up in the same spot there. <laughs> Well, all right then. Okay, I'm gonna. We, we'll end we, uh, as usual. I end the podcast with one question: What are you yeah. listening to? Because we get into all this deep subject matter, and then there's yeah. the, you know the vibrational universal language of music, you know, which is which is always settles the waters when when people can talk about what they've been listening to. Yeah, so it's really interesting. I don't know if you've had this experience with the pandemic. Is I go through these phases now of frankly not listening to music which tends to then make me depressed and then i get into like an intense music listening which gets me out of it and then it kind of it's like following my mental state oh that's, yeah, right yeah, now, yeah it's really interesting right now i'm kind of in a moment where i'm listening to a lot of the anarcho punk stuff that i listened to you know when i was like 16 to 25 mostly kind of rediscovering the relevance yeah, maybe. Re totally and real rediscovering some of the stuff i'm just 
I loved about it. And it's actually been really good at breaking out of a like a depression aspect cycle. Sure. So I sure. like so like the last couple of days, um, like I've I've listened to I'm trying to think of some of the bands because they're not overly well known. The biggest, probably the most well known one is uh, Subhumans. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Like an anarcho punk band that later moved on to um, an anarcho ska band, the Citizen Fish. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, listening to some of them, listening listening to some Discharge, if you've ever heard them, I kind haven't of like heard early Discharge. 80s, actually. It's called D beat. It's just very loud, fast, and screamy, which makes <laughs> sense. <laughs> and uh, for the first time in a while, to this vegan anarchist um oi band oi poloi which are a bunch of uh they're a bunch of scots and they have an entire album oh. that they sing in gaelic wow interesting yeah yeah so what is the name of that band again oi poloi oi poloi yeah i'll have to look that up that's interesting they're actually really and they're actually pretty actually decent as musicians on like some cool punk stuff so actually yeah, scots are really good stuff. musicians when i was working on cruise ships you know as a trombone player oh. i was one ship i was working on where half the band was were scottish it, i don't know how it worked out they they were like all part of the same band or something and they all got hired at the same time so we were playing in this in kind of a big band you know together yeah. and um and they were just ripping like every single one of them and they were telling me that the the competition among scottish musicians was was really high like like the it's always hard to get a gig in a band because there's so many good players in scotland oh so fascinating yeah and then the, one other one i'm going to throw out there just because um as i've been getting getting more and more into like learning japanese working on mm -hmm. japanese political theory i've also been listening to some japanese music and oh, one of the okay. more contemporary female like I don't even know how to describe it. Like sadcore is somewhat thing I've heard huh. of. Like so, like Billy Elish and and um, those kind of folks. Is this uh -huh. woman Aya Gloomy? A Y A Gloomy. Huh. And it's really good. It's like just wow. this really slow, melodic, emotionally interesting, female-led like mixture of um, of like electronic with some traditional Japanese stuff, and it's really pretty cool interesting um, yeah so just kind of a name that most people probably have never heard of that it's totally worth a listen i've been thinking about with these podcasts as i'm just starting to do these things like um as people tell me who they're listening to i was thinking putting together like um, playlist? um <laughs> yeah sort of playlists you know it's like uh you know playlist from you know episodes one through five you know you know that kind of thing yeah. and, and and as a way of like kind of a tapestry of music that people of all different walks of life are listening to and i think it'd be pretty cool because i guarantee i bet you the range of stuff you've heard has been huge absolutely yeah i mean on the last episode we were listening to uh beethoven's uh seventh symphony second Amazing. movement which is gorgeous and i had never heard it before you know which is <laughs> yeah yeah and i've been listening to lately i've been going through you know my own issues with little bit of depression here and there and yep. you know feeling a little dark one day and a little up the next and you know mm -hmm. and I discovered um I don't know how I went my whole life without listening to this stuff but I discovered what I what I guess what I would call is dark pop and dark folk mm -hmm. you know like um like the Elliot Smiths of the world mm -hmm. um um you know Elliot Smith uh, is amazing Dan um oh what's his name uh the guy that wrote Pink Moon um dan arobach you know is, is another know guy um and then uh you know this is i just i love this song uh it's like therapy for me um this song by um it's called sad brad have you ever checked out sad brad no <laughs> oh man check, check out sad brad man I, I actually got i found it from the soundtrack to uh the movie up in the air um oh is it called up in the air the one where the, the where, one yeah, the Clooney one. Yeah, the soundtrack to that movie is so good. There's, that's where I started. I was like hearing those songs, and I was like, "Who are these artists? I really like this song." And, and I found that the soundtrack was made up of a lot of this kind of dark, emotional, folk type stuff, you know. That's and uh, but it's great. It's uh, but check out Sad Brad. Um, I will. Uh, it's it's I such a good song. And I'm sure you've, uh, there's a good chance you've heard them, but kind of related. I always feel like 
the mountain goats are somehow connected with some of that stuff. Yeah, and yeah, they're, yeah. They're, every time I listen to them, I'm always just like, why do I not listen to you more often? You're just... It was a lot of bands when I lived in Minnesota. There was a lot of bands there that f- that fall into that kind of category too, like Snow Patrol and you know, like yeah. groups like that that kind of have this like it's dark, but because it's it's also beautiful and it's mm-hmm. like for me, it's like it's almost like the darker the better for some reason. Like like the the totally. dark music just pulls me in, and it's just it's like prettier for me in a weird way. Like I mean, it taps into what you were talking about with the excitement, like with the like the cultural norms in Eastern Europe, right? Uh-huh, there yeah. is, by like focusing on the dark, there's a lot of beauty in darkness. I mean, in fact, yeah, yeah. it's the yeah. most human of beauties because everyone's going to experience that darkness. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. everyone's going to feel utopian happiness or like excitement in right. the same way. But well, everyone... speak, and it speaks to the moment. I don't remember who that was. It was a famous writer who said, you can only see the light after you've been in the dark you know or something along yeah. those lines and you know here we are in this dark historical moment we're all Very looking dark. for a little bit of light <laughs> and maybe uh-huh. sometimes we find that light by listening to some some really dark music you know that kind of helps us live in that moment for whenever i get really if i ever when i do get really depressed people like elliot smith makes me feel better oh yeah, yeah in a definitely. way that that happy stuff would never do <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy music just pisses me off, actually. <laughs> if you're in that spot, especially. <laughs> <laughs> what does that say about us? <laughs> you're just like, yeah, I get it. Yeah, I'm not there yet, man. I can't listen to that right now. <laughs> exactly. Well, on that note, uh, yeah, well, this great. has been great. Um, yeah, this was uh, fun. Well, this has been another episode of Burnt Out in Budapest. And I hope everybody enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Sean Parson. I think there will be more to come with Sean in the future. Uh, In the meantime, please go and subscribe wherever you see the words Burnt Out in Budapest.